July. I'm Sharon. Happy July, everybody. Uh, this is my very last um, review video. Um, my last day is July 29th, um, so I figured I'd squeeze one more in for you. I have a ton of books to share with you. Um, I have a big pile of picture books. I have some nonfiction that look really good. Um, I have some middle grade books and a few YA. So it's going to be a long video, but stick with me, all right? Um, let's see. Let's start with this one. This is ridiculously cute. It's called Shabbat Hiccups. Um, and I know, you know, we're always looking for a multicultural books that explain certain traditions and celebrations. And this one definitely um, goes over the basics of Shabbat, but with an, an, a really funny twist. And the twist is that this little boy keeps getting the hiccups at the most, you know, inopportune times, naturally. Um, and so the author goes through, you know, the, the process of Shabbat dinner and this poor kid hiccups through the whole thing. And, you know, um, his sister tries to help by scaring him and making him eat sugar. And um, they gave him some uh, juice to drink. And they say, you know, drink a whole bunch. Maybe your hiccups will go away. And then they go for a walk um, at the end of the day. And he's still hiccuping. And then at the very end... Um, which I laughed out loud about. <laughs> he passed them on to his grandma. <laughs> I also, um, you know, I had a long conversation with um, Sally Anderson about this before. About how nice it is when grandmas don't look really, really old. Um, because, you know, grandmas are not always old, old, old ladies. <laughs> Some of them are my age. So, um... There's a nice looking grandma for you right there. So um, if you need books about um, Jewish traditions, this is good. This could also just be a fun story book for your collection, um, a fun little read aloud. It's very sweet. <coughs> I liked it. Um, this book is adorable. I love the art in this book. It's called The Branch, and it's about repurposing things. Um, so this is um, about a little girl who there's a storm, and, you know, in order not to be scared, she imagines herself sitting out on the branch. Um, but as happens in a lot of storms, you know, branches start to fall down, and, um, you know, her tree starts to split, and she becomes very, very sad. But she meets this um, older man next door who um, is repurposing things with the fallen branches, and she becomes friends with him and curious. And so they end up building her a tree house. And I love this little scene, all the little bubbles showing them building and building. And it's they don't reveal to the end what it is. Um, and you see it's a tree house. It's very sweet. It's poetic. The art is fantastic. Um, it's good for, you know, kids who are scared of storms. Um, good for if you want to do some sort of repurposing program in your library. Um, or if you just need a, a sweet story, you know, good read aloud. Good stuff. Very sweet. Um, this one is a little bit um, less happy. <laughs> um, but this is about Parkinson's. Um, I kind of wish I had a better title, um, but it's definitely clear. It's about a little boy whose grandfather has Parkinson's. Um, it's about, you know, him wanting to go to the beach, but grandpa, grandpa has some limitations. Um, and I like how realistic the limitations are. It's not, um, it, it's from the little boy's point of view, but it's very realistic. So, you know, the grandpa gets up and has to rub his feet and has to take his medicine before he can really do anything and they decide to go to the beach and you know he wobbles a little bit and needs help walking um, and you know the little boy remembers what his grandfather used to be like which can't be that long ago because this kid is like what five <laughs> all right wavy there you go um and you know he he is thinking about everything that's changed and so grandpa goes to the boardwalk and he freezes, and if you've ever known anyone with Parkinson's, you know this happens sometimes. And the little boy has been trained by mom, grandpa, I'm not sure, um, to help the grandpa um, unfreeze himself and keep walking, which is adorable. Um, 
And so what I like most about this book is they talk about things and, um, you know, the little boy starts asking you know, very real questions. How come you got Parkinson's? Am I going to get it? Is mom going to get it? Um, you know, do you have it forever? What, why do you have it? You know, and the grandfather asks answers very honestly. Um, you know, it's not like a cold that you can catch. And then he asks, um, you know, did I do it? I, I put my, left my toys on the ground and, um, you stepped over when you bumped your head. Did that hurt your brain? <laughs> it's very cute. And the grandpa, you know, said, no, no, it's not your, your fault. Um, and then at the end is kind of the most sobering part because he asks, can we go to the beach again? And Grandpa says, you know, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. You know, he's tired. He's very tired. So I think this could be a good, if you have um, kind of a, a nonfiction section for parents explaining difficult issues to their kids, this could be good there. Um, it could be a, just a good grand, grandparent story, um, a good sharing story. Um, and definitely, if you have anyone in your community who has Parkinson's, um, this is a good primer, a little, little first description. All right, back to school is happening very soon, and I know back to school books are wildly popular, and this one is adorable, on the first day of kindergarten. And I like this one because it's the perfect read-aloud book, so I shall read some of it to you. On the first day of kindergarten, I thought it was so cool riding the bus to my school. On the second day of kindergarten, I thought it was so cool making lots of friends and riding the bus to school. So it's one of those that it builds on itself and it keeps going. So on the eighth day of kindergarten, I thought it was so cool sharing a story, sorting my sheep, sliding down the slide, singing a song, running in a race, counting up to ten, making lots of friends, and riding the bus to my school. So it keeps going and it keeps going. Um, and it goes up to, I think the twelfth day is the, yeah, the twelfth day is the, the highest one. Um, and it's, you know, on the 12th day of kindergarten, I thought it was so cool going on a field trip. And it goes through the whole list. And then in the very end, it says, if I can get the page to turn, we love school. So it's a good read aloud. It doesn't rhyme, which is disappointing, but um, still good read aloud. I think the kids will really like it. If you need new back to school books, this is definitely fits the bill. All right, this one here, A Piece of Home, um, this is about a family who has moved to, I think, West Virginia. Yeah, West Virginia from Korea. And it's basically about how they tried to fit in. Um, and I love the way this book starts. It says... I'm having trouble with pages today. In Korea, my grandfather was a grandmother was a wise and wonderful teacher. When students bowed, she held her shoulders erect, but her eyes sparkled. Even at home, my grandmother could fix the extraordinary held within the ordinary could find the extraordinary help within the ordinary, like how she coaxed her shrubs to blossom into flowers, revealing their bright red centers. In Korea, I was ordinary, a regular boy playing and laughing and bossing. My little sister, bossing my little sister, I was not extraordinary, not different. I was just me, like so many others. And then they moved to West Virginia, and you can imagine how that changes things. Um, so they pack and they move, and it says, in West Virginia, my grandmother stays at home. She does not hold her shoulders erect. Her eyes don't gleam, not at all. In West Virginia, I am not ordinary. I am different. And it's a little bit about, you know, not, <coughs> excuse me, fitting in, <coughs> not knowing the language. Um, there's a little bit of bullying, and, you know, the little girl is having a tough time. Luckily, sorry, now the book is falling apart. I'm having mad issues today. Um... Ah, okay, sleeve. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, the little girl is having, you know, a lot of struggles. Luckily, the father speaks English fluently, and so he's able to talk to the school. But the little boy says, you know, that doesn't help me. Um, they still aren't, no one's helping me. And so, um, 
he starts to learn a, a few words, and the grandmother starts to learn a few words, and then um, he becomes, he gets some friends, and then one day the flowers bloom in the yard, and his grandmother kind of lights up, and they start talking about them, and they learn the word for the flowers in English, um, and they compare them to the word, the same word in, in Korean, and um, it's just adorable how they found a little piece of home right there in their backyard. Um, so it's very, very cute. Um, good if you have new immigrants in your in your community or just an adorable story. It could be good <coughs> for anybody. <coughs> now I'm chunking in my own spit. I'm so graceful. This book is phenomenal. I love this book. Emma and Julia Love Ballet. So I'm sure you have ballerinas in your community. And this is a story that has two, two parallel stories. So you have Emma and you have Julia. And Emma's a little girl. And Julia is probably a teenager, maybe early 20s. And Emma is a little girl in dance class. And Julia is a professional dancer. And as you go, it's basically parallel. So as Emma's mother drives her to her lesson, Julia takes the bus by herself. Emma goes to the dance studio and puts away her coat and bag, and Julia does the same. Emma's teacher begins class, and Julia's teacher begins class too. And you can see this, like, you know, this little comparison. It's really cute. And then um, they stretch and they move and they dance. And when they are done, um, Emma's parents are waiting to take her home. She's excited about the performance they're going to see in the city. And Julia's in the performance. Um, and so then there's a little bit about, you know, what they do to prepare for the show. Because Emma, of course, is getting dressed up to go to the show. And Julia is warming up to perform in the show. And so she goes and she sees the ballet. And she's so excited, and she dreams out being a ballerina. And at the very end, she gets to meet Julia. And they hug, and she says, I have always wanted to be a ballerina. And Julia says, you know, one time I was you. I used to dream about it, too, and now I am. And it's adorable. So cute. I love the way it's written. Um, and I love that the ballerina is an African-American um, and the little girl is white. Um, that interplay, I think, is just is fantastic, um, especially nowadays with, and I can never remember her name, that fantastic ballerina um, who's in the news right now, who's just totally amazing. Um, I'm terrible with names, as you probably have noticed. Um, all right, next, Wanted, Ralphie Rabbit Book Burglar. Now, I looked at this book and I thought, this looks dumb, <laughs> but it's not. It's hysterical. This is about a bunny who is different from the other bunnies. He doesn't like vegetables. Instead, he likes books. And he likes books so much that he has lists of books he wants to read, and he needs to find them, and he wants to read them. And he has no interest in carrots. And so um, he started sneaking into people's houses and taking their books. So he would burrow into people's houses and take their books um, because he wanted to read them. And it says, he crept off with comics and cookbooks, dashed away with dictionaries, nab novels, and pinched poetry. Ralphie had more books to read than ever before. He was so pleased with himself. And um, then he meets Arthur. And Arthur is also a book lover. And Arthur is hysterical. He's this little red-headed kid. And he's been finding little chewed up vegetables in his bookshelves. And his favorite book is Missing. And that favorite book is the biggest book of monsters ever. And he suspects this little rabbit. Um, and so he finds, he sees the bunny, and um, he is very upset that his book is missing. So, of course, what does he do? He calls the police. And he tells the police, hi, a bunny stole my book. And they laugh at him. But, just you wait. This is where this, the kids are going to love it. Um, Raffy, Ralphie the bunny, he sneaks into another house to steal books, and it happens to be the police officer's house. Uh-oh. So he's caught one ahead, red-handed, and the police officer calls um, Arthur and says, we found the culprit, we found him, and he has your book, come and get him. So, but then he has to do a lineup. 
the problem is, is that they're all wearing the same shirt that says, I love books. And all Arthur knows is that he's a brown bunny that's wearing a shirt that says, I love books, which doesn't help him very much. So what they do is they put a conveyor belt in front of him, and they put vegetables. And of course, Ralphie only wants books, and it's pretty obvious. <laughs> so that's how they catch him. And at the very end of the book, which is the best part, <clears throat> Arthur becomes friends with Ralphie, and he says, you know, you don't have to steal books, you can borrow them. Let me take you to a special place where you can borrow books. The library. We love it, right? It's adorable. Um, so Ralphie's adorable, Arthur's adorable. I think that story's going to go over like gangbusters. All right, next, introducing Teddy. So right now in our society, um, there's a lot of talk about gender. Um, gender identity is huge, and I'm sure you have some children in your community who are struggling with gender identity, um, maybe even um, going by pronouns that differ from their biological gender, um, and it starts pretty young. And so this is a book um, that introduces the idea that sometimes people change their names and their pronouns, um, and that it's okay. So this is about this little boy and his little, um, he must be a bear, yeah, a bear, um, named Teddy, and they do everything together. They have sandwiches for lunch in the treehouse, they plant vegetables, they have tea parties inside when it's raining, um, and Thomas is kind of sad, and, um, and he says, so Thomas, um, not Thomas, Errol asks Thomas, I'm sorry, I said the same, oh my gosh, I'm losing it. His name isn't Teddy, it's Thomas. Um, Errol says, I'm worried about you, what's the matter? He says, I'm worried that if I tell you, you won't be my friend anymore. He says, I'll always be your friend, tell me what's bothering you. And he says, well, in my heart, I don't think I'm a boy, Teddy. I think I'm a girl, Teddy, and I think my name is Tilly. And Errol says, that's cool. And as you know, most young kids like this also have the same reaction. That's cool, wanna play? And so... Um, it definitely captures the innocence of the young kids. Um, and she's like, he's like, is that why you've been so sad? I don't care if you're a girl, Teddy, or a boy, Teddy. What matters is that you are my friend. And so um, he calls his friend Ava, who's building a robot, which I love the gender, you know, non-stereotypes here. Um, and they go and play, and um, he introduce, introduces Ava to Tilly and says, um, Hi, Ava. Teddy has a new name. Let me introduce you to Tilly. That's cool. Tilly's a nice name. Let's go play. I wish grown-ups were like that. Um, so this is a cute book. Very sweet. Very simple. Um, it could be a good um, real ad book, but it also could be good for those kids who are struggling with these kinds of issues. Um, so they don't feel so alone. All right. This one, Dario and the Whale, is about whale migration. It's about right whales. Um, so if you have kids who like whales, this could be a really good one. And um, so this is about a little boy who lives in Brazil. And um, every summer he would go and see the whales. And he'd play soccer on the beach and see the whales. And um, he'd see them puffing air and he'd see them breach. Um, and then he sees, he actually makes eye contact with the whale, which is amazing. He gets, and he becomes friends, and he becomes very attached to the whale. But of course, you know, the whales don't say forever, right? And so um, every day he goes to the beach, every day the whale's there, and they swim back and forth for hours. And um, then one day he goes out, and there's no whale there. And his friend says... Well, they migrate. They leave. And he gets very, very sad. How come they leave? And, um, but then his friend is out in the water splashing, and he runs out to the water. Let me see if I can get this whole spread for you. See, he runs out to the water, and the whale gets really close, and he waves to him, and he waves goodbye. And he says, see you next summer. So, you know, wrapped up in this book is a lot, you know, it's about migration, it's also about loss, it's also about tradition, it's about seasons, um, it's about loss and change, so, you know, there's a lot wrapped up in this little book, um, it's very sweet, and I love that it takes place in Brazil, um, because this really happens. 
and there's information about right whales in the back, which is fun. Um, so if you have kids who are interested in sea life or whales, it could be a good, good choice. This book is hilarious. Who wants a tortoise? <laughs> and this little girl has some serious spunk. Look at that attitude. Um, wow. This looks like the kind of book, MC Baker, if you're watching this, I think your daughter might need to read this book. Um, yes. So this little girl has been dreaming of getting a puppy her whole life. She's very serious about it. She wants a waggly tailed puppy. And the only thing she wants for her birthday is a puppy. Um, but her mom, her dad is allergic. And so she has a party and she opens the, the box and she still thinks she's getting a puppy because the box has holes in the top. But no, it's a tortoise. And she is mad. Tortoise? Who wants a tortoise? And so um, her friends, you know, try to do the best. Um, and she's, you know, she can't even name the thing because it can't do anything. And she makes a list of all the things that dogs can do and all the things tortoises can do. And, of course, tortoises don't do much. She's very upset. They don't get excited and they don't wag their tails. Um, but they do play makeover because they sit very, very still. So um, it's, yeah, it's pretty funny. And then when their grandma and grandpa come, they teach her a little bit about tor tortoises and how they're related to dinosaurs, and she gets kind of excited. And so they go for a walk, um, and so, but there's no place to hold a leash, so she puts, she duct tapes the tortoise to a skateboard, which I don't think the animal rights people would really approve of, but it's still funny because this kid is hysterical. Um, yeah, and so she takes him for a walk, and um, she sets up a lemonade stand, but she also sets up a little side stand that's hold a tortoise. And they sold tortoise, well, of course, right? So they can hold the tortoise. So everyone's very excited about the tortoise, and she starts to see that the tortoise is kind of a cool, um, a cool pet. But then she takes the tortoise to school, and they play hide and seek, and she loses the tortoise. So she has to use all her lemonade fun, funds to go and find the tortoise and make lost signs. And she can't find him anywhere, and she's very sad. And um, she puts out snacks, and he never comes back. Um, but then um, they're at dinner, and Mom happens to mention that the neighbor thinks a rabbit's nibbling her cabbages. And she runs out the door because she knows it's her tortoise. And she scoops him up and apologizes and runs away. And she says, that rascally guy with the waggly tail belongs to me. <laughs> Um, and so they have a welcome home parade, which is hilarious, and they celebrate by painting everybody's toenails, sparkling raspberry delight, including there's a dog in the back, if you can see him. Dog in the back, who has sparkly pink toenails, too. Um, and then as she's falling asleep, she finally comes up with a name for the tortoise, Rover. <laughs> it's really sweet, um, and I'm sure there's an abstinent little girl, you know, just obstinate, excuse me, obstinate little girl in your life who needs this book, someone who is stubborn, and doesn't always get in the way and is not happy when she does. All right, so sheep are like my favorite thing. You probably know this already. Um, but this book is hysterical. Wally does not want a haircut. Um, <laughs> so Wally is a sheep and he really doesn't want a haircut. But as you can see, critters are starting to live in him and he's kind of sneaky and large. And um, he says he's perfectly fine, but he's tripping over things. And he can't hug his mom. And she gets a haircut, and um, he says no way. So he hides in the bushes. And um, the hilarious part, this is the hysterical part, is everyone on the farm gets a haircut and a hairdo. Check those hairdos out. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone gets a hairdo. And he's feeling a little left out, but he's hiding in the hay because he doesn't want a haircut. But look at that face. Oh. And then he gets stuck. He's stuck in the hay. And so they have to use a horse um, with an awesome um, mohawk to get him out. And after that, he agrees that, okay, fine, I'll get a haircut. I'll get a haircut. There's a snippy, 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 snippy. <laughs> 
and he gets a haircut, and finally, he's free, and he's dancing, and I think the kids would have so much fun dancing like a free sheep. So there you go. Hilarious. This is good stuff. So, you can't have just one sheep book. You gotta have two. So this book is phenomenal. It is actually um, written as though it were an essay written for a teacher in school. So it's called My Favorite Pets. And so it's by Gus W. from Ms. Smolinski's class. And um, so when you look at it, he says, um, my favorite pet is a sheep. Not sheeps. Sheep. And they're, the pictures are adorable. And he says, a girl sheep is a you. If you say, hey, you, she won't answer, even if you shout it. A baby sheep is a lamb. If you trade your little brother for a lamb, your brother will say, why is Sammy covered in hay? <laughs> sheep look silly with pajamas on their head, especially your little brother's favorite porpoise pajamas. You know, it's just really, really funny. Um, you can't put a sheep in a wearable a wheelbarrow you can't put them in the car even a big car you can get them in the house but they won't like the kitchen so the whole book reads like this just a hilariousness you know of this kid who probably tried all of these things um and um it's in this kind of kid handwriting but it's still legible which is good um so the the sheep make a mess in the house but they're still his favorite pets and so at the end of the story, there's a grade. <laughs> oh, boy. So um, hilarious, good stuff. I'm sure you have sheep lovers in your class. All right, so that's all the picture books I have for you. Um, I'm going to move on. I have four nonfiction books, and then we'll move on to the chapter books. So the first nonfiction book I want to show you is called Crow Smarts. And this is from a series called Scientists in the Field. Um, and normally I don't review books like this, but this got really good reviews. So this is about crows, and it's about um, how smart they are. And basically it compares crows to humans on a lot of different levels. And there are some really cool pictures in here, just gorgeous photography. And it talks a lot about how they use tools, how they think, their family structure, how they gather food, how they communicate. Um, and it talks about the evolution of them as well and how, in some respects, they're just as smart as people. And I think there are some kids, especially if you're in a middle school, there are some kids who just love this kind of stuff. Um, they're really going to want to see it. There's also some information about um, scientists who track um, the migratory patterns, and you can't tell the gender of a crow without taking blood. So they take blood samples and they track them. They look at their families and they track their health. And it talks about where they are, um, where, where they live, where they come from. Um, it's really cool. And so um, I just think this is a great, a great book. And then there's a Q&A at the end. Good, good pictures. Um, so if you're a middle school librarian, or if you have a public, are you a public librarian? You have um, middle school kids who love nonfiction. This could be a really, really good book. There's a lot of text in it, um, but excellent topic. Not something you see a lot of. Um, kind of in the same line, Bridge to the Wild. This is um, Secrets Inside the Zoo. This is the Atlanta Zoo, and I know zoos have been in the news a lot lately, so you might have kids that are asking questions about zoos and safety and how they take care of animals, um, and, you know, some of it's worrisome. Now, this is all about the Atlanta Zoo. There's some fantastic photographs, um, and it's all about what, why zoos, um, why did they exist, the research that they do, taking care of the animals. Um, and of course, there are pictures of a lot of their animals. Um, and there is information about taking care of them and the vets, which I just think is the most fascinating part. Um, you know, the vets come around and, and check on the animals and take care of them. Um, so it does just focus on this one zoo, but I just think it's awesome. I think kids are going to love it. Um, nice photos, 
um, kids who aren't old enough to read the text could just go through and, and look at the photos because I think the photos are really phenomenal. Um, the kids who are interested in zoos and why they exist and, and how they run could be really interested in this. So there's another one for you. Um, next, this is Let Your Voice Be Heard by Anita Sylvie, by Pete Seeger. Um, Anita Sylvie is awesome. She was one of my professors in library school. She's awesome. And um, Pete Seeger, I'm not sure how popular a topic he might be. Um, we certainly as adults know who he is. I don't know that kids do. But if you have biography projects in your school and you have kids who are interested in music, this might be a good um, a good option. You know, the text isn't overwhelming, and there's a lot of inserts and pictures. Um, it's not terribly long. It's, um, let's see, it's about 85 pages, not including the end notes. Um, so I think, you know, it could be interesting, um, but only if you have kids who are interested in this kind of thing. Like I said, Anita Selby is awesome, um, but I'm not sure about the topic. Um, so use your judgment. And last in my nonfiction collection is a book that's more appropriate for high school. This is um, a book about Jazz Jennings, um, and it's called Being Jazz, and it's My Life as a Transgender Teen. Jazz Jennings has been in the news a lot lately. She um, was born biologically a boy, um, but has been living as a girl since she's very young. I um, mean, this is just her biography, her autobiography, and there are lots of pictures in here. Um, it is a thicker novel, though, so I think mostly teenagers are going to want to attack it. Um, but it's a nice story about, you know, growing up and um, days that she celebrated and days that she didn't. And, um, you know, the, the last day she dressed as a boy at school and then the first time that, that she went out dressed as a girl using the right pronouns and um, then a little later, like, meeting Rosie O'Donnell and being on magazine covers and winning the Trevor Award and like that. Um, this, I know there's, a, I think, a TLC series on this on her, so um, kids might be interested in this. It's also a hot, hot topic, so might be a, um, a good addition to your collection. Alrighty, so that's it for picture books and nonfiction. I'm going to start with some um, middle grade, and then we'll go on to um, the longer chapter books. Let's start with this one, Lucy by Randy Cecil. This book is... Um, each page has a round black and white photo and um, photo illustration. The illustrations are a little fuzzy for me personally. There's some sparse text, but the story got rave reviews. It's um, intertwined three different stories. So it's the story of a dog who's homeless, a little girl who likes to say hi to the homeless dog, and then the little girl's father who's a juggler but who has stage fright. And so um, the three of their stories intertwine. Um, and like I said, every page has this little, like a picture and um, a few sentences or maybe one sentence. Um, it's all black and white. And um, it, this is a heavy book, but it's not a, a challenging read. It's definitely a young read. Um, so you might have kids who like this kind of stuff. The pictures aren't really for me, but it doesn't have to be for me. <laughs> Speaking of not for me, I hate talking squirrels so much, so much, but I hear kids like them. So here you go. This one looks actually kind of complicated. Um, this is about a uh, squirrel who um, lives in this kind of land where there's two rival groups. It's the cloud, Cloudfoots and the North Enders. Um, and there's a trial, and there's membership, and there's like, it's kind of like the battle of, it's like a little civil war going on. I mean, he's stuck in the middle. Um, it looks like a squirrel story, um, but I know kids really like these kinds of stories, so I figured I would show it to you in case you have those kinds of kids. Um, it looks like a, like I said, a little complicated for a, a little squirrel story, but if you have kids who like these kind of animal tales, it could be good. All right, Kirby Larson has a new one. Kirby Larson is one of my all-time favorite authors. Um, she wrote um, 
Hattie Big Sky, and then she lately has been writing um, younger books. And this is the start of her new series, Audacity Jones. Um, and it looks a little uh, fantastical, um, but fun. So Audacity Jones goes to Miss Maisie's School for Wayward Girls. And um, she gets in trouble all the time. And um, she's always out having adventures. And then one day, the mysterious Commodore Crutchfield visits the school. And um, he sweeps her off to D.C. And they have adventures. And there's a plot. And they want to save the president. And all sorts of crazy stuff happens. Um, it got really good reviews. It's the beginning of a series. Um, so if you have kids who like these kind of like light adventure stories, this could, could hit the spot. This book looks adorable. It's called Ms. Bixby's Last Day. Um, it's a little on the thicker side. It's, um, hmm, let's see how long this book is. 200, it's 300 pages. Um, and this is about a fabulous teacher. So the, this inside says, everyone knows there are different kinds of teachers. The good ones, the not so good ones, the boring ones, the mean ones, the ones who try too hard. The ones you'll never be remember, the ones you want to forget. But Ms. Bixby is none of these. She's the sort of teacher who makes you feel like the indignity of school is worthwhile. Um, so this is about three friends, Topher, Brandon, Steve, and they find out that Ms. Bixby is sick and she's not going to finish out the school year. And so they plot to make her last day at school the best day ever. And it sounds like a lot of shenanigans, but also a lot of, you know, it's emotional um, that these kids love her so much um, and they're going to lose her. And um, it just, it looks, it looks precious. Um, so you definitely need this book. Definitely. It's a little long, but it's a younger book. Um, probably fourth, fifth grade. Good one. All right, this one here, this looks like one of those short, easy to read books that's a little heart pounding, but for younger kids. Um, so this is about a kid, um, I don't remember her name, Cammie Summers. And she has just moved to this new area and there's some sort of, she wants to be one of the popular girls and they have a fake initiation and she ends up trapped in the bottom of a well. And she is waiting for them to come get her and they don't come get her and she's getting hungry and she's getting scared. Uh, no one comes to get her. And so she starts to imagine, um, you know, that there are zombies and kind of coyote and goats with her in there to keep her company and scaring the pants off of her. Um, it seems like the kind of story that takes place in a very defined period of time, probably from the time that she falls in to the time that she's rescued. Um, it's short and um, the writing is really big, but my guess is it's a little scary. Um, so for your kids who like a good heart pound, um, but it looks like a fun book, a little different than, than other things we've seen. Avi has a new book. Um, Avi writes so fast and furious, it's kind of crazy. This one's called School of the Dead, and this book cracked me up because it says, everybody has a weird uncle, no big deal. And so, um, Tony Gilbert's great uncle, Charlie, is a bit weird. That is, until he moves in with Charlie and his family. Sure, Uncle Charlie is strange, constantly talking about ghosts and spirits, but Tony considers him just an oddball. And anyway, he's fun. So when Uncle Charlie dies, Tony's beside himself. And then he has to move across the country. Um, but then Uncle Charlie starts showing up everywhere. And he sees him on the street in his room in his new school, and maybe his tales are true. And so in the midst of losing his favorite uncle and moving across the country, his uncle maybe is a specter, maybe he's a ghost, maybe he's something else um, who's following him around and kind of keeping him company and scaring the bejesus out of him. So this looks interesting. Um, I It got good reviews. Um, I have mixed feelings about Avi, although I was impressed with the last one, um, Catch, Catch You Later Trader. So I have hopes for this one. This one could be good. Plus, who doesn't like a good ghost story? All right, next. Um, this book here, Heart of a Champion, is about um, the Japanese internment camps. We haven't had a book like this in a while. Um, Kirby Larson had one, though, a couple years ago. 
dash maybe. Um, and this one looks pretty good. It's about baseball. So I think you could get those baseball fans um, and some of your boy readers who are interested in this. Um, it's about 10-year-old Kenny um, and his older brother. They play baseball, but then, of course, Pearl Harbor happens in 1941 and everything is closed. Um, and there's all kinds of chaos happening in their community. And baseball, of course, um, is the, you know, the least of their concerns. Um, so this is, you know, that it doesn't look groundbreaking in terms of content, um, but if you need a new book or if you have kids who are interested in the subject, um, this could fit the bill. All right, next, The Distance to Home, another baseball book. This is actually written by a friend of mine, um, Jen Bishop, who's a, a young adult librarian. Um, so I was excited to see this book. She, um, This is her very first book. Um, so this book is told um, in two different summers, so there's two different summers that are um, intertwined. And basically last summer, Quinnen, um, she was the star pitcher of her baseball team, um, and she had a loyal supporter in her big sister, Haley. She was her best friend, always in the stands for her. But then Haley died, and now this summer, she has this, she describes it, a Haley sized hole in her world, um, and she doesn't know how to deal. And um, so she's playing baseball, but she, you know, there's, her best friend isn't in the stands. Um, and so um, she becomes friends with some players and tries to get over it. Grief is definitely um, a common theme in um, these this age level book, middle grade books, um, but this one looks good and um, also baseball, love it. So give this one a try if you have need of this type of book, if you have readers who like those kinds of books. Ronald Kidd, um, you'll recognize his name, his um, book Night on Fire was on the Canfield Fisher list this year. This book's a little different. Um, this is, I have a couple of kind of light dystopian books in my pile, and this is um, a middle grade novel, but it's dystopia, um, and it was described in the um, review as kind of softer dystopia. Um, so this is um, an old city during the time of, quote, the warming, and it's sometime in the future, and um, they have been told... Um, that they shouldn't have strong emotions, no music, no art, um, everything is, um, everything like that is dangerous. And so everyone has a specific job, and um, this main character, whose name is Jeremy, is, um, uh, he acts, he works with the computers to bend people's dreams. And he basically removes the emotional content and the singing and the art and the dancing and the music from people's dreams so that their dreams can be pure and non-threatening. Um, but then, of course, he starts um, experiencing some of these artistic emotions and starts to question whether or not this is actually a good idea. So this could be good. If it's anything like Night on Fire, it's going to be wonderful. So there you go. Here's my second dystopian novel of the uh, um, the review series. Will Rodman Philbrick has a new one. This is not a new topic at all, but Philbrick is a great author. This is a slim novel, and it's basically about if all the electricity in the entire Earth went out. Um, we've had a couple of books like that in the past, um, but this one looks like it could be okay um, or good. It got decent reviews. Um, and, you know, he is alone and um, no cell phones, no televisions, no, um, a lot of cars stopped, um, no lights, and has to tackle the real world. Um, so it could be a little scary. Again, it's like introductory dystopia. Um, all right, so next, um, The Seventh Wish, I just, uh, I read this last week last week or a week before. Um, Kate Messner's book has been getting a lot of buzz on social media. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful book. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you do. Um, and she's going to be donating some copies um, to the Department of Libraries because she's awesome. And I'm hoping to um, distribute those out to some of you. Um, there's not enough for everybody, but it's enough to get around. Um, so definitely try to get your hands on this. This is a book about a girl, um, I'm trying to remember how old she is. Um, she, her name is Charlie, and um, she's, I think she's about 11, and she does Irish step dancing, and she likes to go ice fishing with her 
buddy down the street um, and his grandmother and they go ice fishing and there's a lot of details about ice fishing I didn't know anything about because I'm a city girl um, and when she goes ice fishing she's um, in the beginning she's really afraid of going out on the ice which is understandable and so she cuts her hole close to the shore um, where it's not that deep and she gets this fish with the sparkly eye and the fish says put me back and I'll grant you a wish. And so she wishes not to be afraid of the ice anymore. Suddenly she's not. And so this keeps happening. She keeps going back and going back to that same ice hole and she keeps making wishes. And um, at the same time, her older sister is off at college and some very strange things are happening. And it turns out that her sister is addicted to heroin. And um, she is having some terrible times at school and they end up putting her in a treatment facility. Now, um, Charlie wants to go to an Irish step dance competition and needs money for um, a costume and is vying for attention from her parents, um, but is being dragged to see her sister every weekend at this treatment facility um, and is having a really hard time with it. Um, but, you know, in the end, one of her wishes is that her sister is healthy and um, and, and is able to um, rehabilitate herself, which is very, very hard. Um, so, you know, this book has ended up on some controversial conversations because it has to do with heroin. However, heroin is a very big issue in Vermont. Um, it's a very big issue everywhere. Drug addiction is a serious, serious issue that a lot of kids have to deal with. Um, and I think this is an awesome book. I think a lot of kids will um, really relate to the idea of having a sibling who takes up too much attention and who's having problems and the parents are um, focusing on them and not on, on the kid who you're talking to and um, growing up and, and trying to um, figure out what's important in life. Um, so I think this is a fantastic book. I think you should read it. I think you should give it to kids. Um, I think you should do book clubs with it. I think it's a really, really good discussion book. All right. Another local author, Joe Knowles, who we love. Look at that cover. So cute. Um, so this book, um, also a heavy topic. Our local authors love to tackle these heavy topics. Um, this is a story about... Um, Noah and his best friends and his older sister Emma um, and Emma is struggling with an eating disorder and they don't talk about it and so this is kind of um, this kid Noah and trying to figure out you know school and dealing with a sister who's obviously has a problem um, and I hope and I trust Joe Knowles um, that will be addressed somewhere in this book. So eating disorders are another issue, um, a hot topic, controversial, but very, very a big problem. And I think um, it's worth talking about with our younger kids, especially since eating disorders are starting to develop younger and younger these days, which is the sad, sad truth. Um, so I will be stealing this on my way to Pennsylvania so I could read it. Um, so I hope you get hands on copy, hands on the copy too. All right, I got one more pile. These are more YA. The first one is called Wax, and I picked it out because it takes place in Vermont in a town called Paraffin. Um, it looks very strange. Gina D'Amico has written some very odd books, one called Hellhole that I really seem to remember. I think I reviewed it in my very first material review video because I liked the title. I never actually read it, but anyway, <laughs> hysterical. Um, it's about this wax museum in this town called Paraffin, and um, it's, there's all these lifelike sculptures, and um, this kid named Poppy, um, she is investigating, and one of the wax sculptures jumps into the trunk of her car, and she wants to go take him back, but the, um, the shop burns down and all of the wax sculptures disappear. And so then they start uncovering the mysteries of paraffin and the wax sculptures and who was there and who might have set it on fire. Um, it looks just terrible enough to be good. So I, I like that. All right, Girl in the Blue Coat, I just finished. Um, it's fantastic. This is a book about the Holocaust, um, but it's from a different angle. So this takes place in Amsterdam. And it's about a girl who um, is kind of a black market um, uh, go-between. She finds materials, 
stuff from the black market. She's able to sneak it through the guards, and she hooks up people with money with this stuff. And basically, her family, without knowing it, um, are relying on her to bring in their income um, for, you know, food and stuff. If I knew where my phone was, I would shut it off. <laughs> Here we go. Um, this is a really, really good book. Um, it's very gritty, um, and it's about, you know, she is doing all this really dangerous stuff, and then one day somebody asks her not to get them stuff, but to find a person. And so they're looking for this girl in a blue coat, and she ends up in this kind of underground ring of people who are trying to smuggle people out um, of these holding centers before they get shipped off to the concentration camps. Um, and she learns a lot of what's going on in the inside. Um, cause even working in the black market, she doesn't really, you know, feel what's happening cause she's not Jewish. Um, so this is a really, really good book. Um, it reads like a suspense novel. I sit up half the night reading it cause I just could not put it down. Really, really fast read. Great, great stuff. Um, it's been nominated for the Canfield Fisher list, um, and I do hope that it makes it through that um, because it's fantastic. All right, next, one of my favorite authors. I have a lot of favorite authors. <laughs> Dana Reinhardt. She writes really great stuff. This is a shorter book, um, and this is an interesting story. It's it. I like this because it's fresh and different. Um, it's about a 17 year old named River who gets dumped and he just doesn't know what to do and he doesn't know how to drive. So he starts walking and he ends up with this teen support group for kids with addictions and he wants to, you know, forget his relationship and he wants to make friends. So what he ends up doing is pretending that he has an addiction and joining the support group. And he, you know, likes the connection and he likes um, the people there. And so the lies just keeps kind of spinning out of tr out of control. Um, and uh, so I'll be interested to see how this one resolves. But her books are always really, really good. So um, it looks good. This is another book set in Vermont. Um, this is True Letters from a Fictional Life. Um, this is um, a coming out novel, which I think looks fantastic. It's about a boy who lives in, I don't think they, they just say small town Vermont. His name is James. He's a star athlete, decent student, and he has a, a girlfriend. And he writes letters that he never intends to send to anybody, and he keeps them in the drawer. And these letters are about who he really is. And he thinks he's gay. He's pretty sure um, that he doesn't actually like his girlfriend. And um, he's not sure he wants to come out because he's really afraid of what this, his family and what the town would say. Um, and there are a lot of towns in Vermont like this. Um, where people are not open. I, you know, we would hope that there aren't people like that, but we know there are. Um, and a lot of kids really struggle with the coming out process. Um, even though the world is getting a little bit more open, it's still a very difficult process. And I think there are kids out there who really need a book like this, um, where, you know, a boy is, is struggling with identity and, and coming out and coming out of his shell and trusting people. Um, and so getting this peek into his secret life could be really good. He got rave reviews. It looks phenomenal. I highly recommend it. All right, next one, Unbecoming. Jenny Downham wrote Before I Die, which um, is an older book, but it's really, really good. Um, and this book looks wonderful. It's about three generations of this family. Um, you have the daughter, um, and she's in love, but she doesn't want to tell anyone who she's in love with. And then she has this uptight mother um, who... Um, doesn't to really talk about herself or her past. And then one day her grandmother shows up at the door because she's been estranged from the family, but she has Alzheimer's. And so they're trying to take care of her. And as she's taking care of her, she has to do some research into who her grandmother is and, you know, what stories her family has um, that she hasn't learned. And she learns all these crazy stories about her family. Um, so I think um, this looks like a really great um, novel, generations of, of uh, women, good stuff. All right, next, a little darker, um, A Better Blood. This cover is creepy as hell. It takes place in 1922 in Manhattan, loosely based on historical um, happenings, and it's about um, the racial cleansing 
Um, and it was in terms of um, this, well, okay, so it's about a kid named Ro Rowan who gets polio and is institutionalized. And back then, um, everyone was just kind of put in homes, anybody who was unfit for society. And um, her only way to get out of town is to take a summer job with um, this traveling freak show. And um, this freak show basically goes around trying to convince everybody um, that freaks should be sterilized and that purity was the important thing in society. And so this is how she makes her living is by she, he, I think it's a he, um, and tries to, um, you know, is entertaining people with his disability, which is horrifying. Um, and he makes some friends, also freaks, and, um, you know, is struggling through this. This looks like a really thought-provoking book, something that doesn't get talked about a lot, a lot um, and something that I think teens would be really, really interested in. I know I am. Good historical stuff. All right, the last book on my pile, I promise, is The New Francisco Stork. I love Francisco Stork. If you haven't read Marcello in the Real World, read it now. Just do it. Um, and I was so excited to see his new book out. Um, it looks wonderful. Um, and so this is a book about suicide, which is also an important topic, um, and I'm glad people are writing about it. And this is about a person, um, I think, boy, um, no, girl, who um, wakes up in the hospital after she tries to kill herself and um, has to start the healing process and meet some other people in um, in the hospital recovering the mental health wing and um, tries to figure out what to do next and you know this story isn't told very often um, you know what happens when you try to kill yourself and then afterwards you know you really didn't intend to wake up so this looks really really good dark definitely but your teenagers will love it is that enough for you all right I've been talking for an hour um, that's all I have for you right now um, like I said, my last day is July 29th. Um, if you need to reach me, if you need to know about a book, um, I won't be reading children's literature um, starting in August because I will be in a, um, in a graduate school program working on my PhD. Um, but if there are books you think I should read, you can find me. Um, Jennifer Johnson will have my contact information. Um, and... Um, you can send me emails, send me letters, tell me things that I should be reading. I'm always be looking for happy books to read while I'm falling asleep. Um, and take good care of yourself. Take good care of your kids. Happy reading. It's been an immense pleasure um, talking to you um, about books. And I hope that you have a fantastic summer um, and that um, you do well in the future. Take good care.